Okay. So let's get started, guys. Today's topic is the Compton effect. I think you guys are going to like this one because it is really straightforward. And if you get a question on the Compton effect, you're there's not a lot of twists to it like some of the other topics we've had before where there's a lot of interpretation. I think this one's going to be about as straightforward as I can imagine, but I don't know. I guess we'll see. I mean, I have no idea what that diploma looks like. So, um, before we actually use the Compton effect formulas, I just, I'm going to read off of my notes, just what we've done so far, a bit of, bit of a summary. Okay. Um, the photoelectric effect, do you guys actually remember the photoelectric effect? Should we review that real quick? Okay. So the photoelectric effect is probably one of the most influential, um, just, I guess, experiments or discoveries, whatever you want to call it. It wasn't an electron hits the surface. Imagine that you have like some metal over here and you shine a light on this metal. Light or any sort of EMR, I don't really care what we're talking about, but it, 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 we consider it to come in like photons. And there was a formula for photons, E equals H times F. You guys remember this formula? Basically, they, they discovered that each individual photon had a certain amount of energy. And if the energy was enough, it could kick out some electrons off of metal if it hits it hard enough. I guess is a good way of putting it, with a high enough energy. Now, one of the first thoughts that scientists had was, well, let's say that electrons aren't getting knocked off of this metal. Shine a brighter light. That's what their thought was. Doesn't that make intuitive sense? Well, just shine. I mean, if you're shining like a little weak little, you know, flashlight, get a big flood lamp and shine it on that. Did that do anything though? The answer was no, it didn't actually. What they had to do is shine a different frequency of light. Um, one of the guys we talked about in our notes before was Hertz, who was doing his experiments with trying to test um, like receivers and transmitters of EMR, and he discovered that ultraviolet light seemed to work even better. Why does UV, why does UV light work best? Sure, right. I mean, it's actually outside of the light spectrum technically, right? And if we were to go past UV, then like x-rays or gamma rays, they probably work even better, right? So long story short, if you up the frequency, it ups the amount of energy. And this energy could cause like, uh, there was a diagram, let me find that one. It's gonna do it better than I can. Here it is. If the photon has enough energy coming in and it hits this metal, it could knock an electron loose. If it doesn't have enough energy, nothing happens. And that's where this formula came in. There's something we, we, we defined it as called the work function. If you have a minimum amount of energy, you can actually do enough work to knock the electron out. If not, nothing happens. Sorry, I went backwards in the notes to the last days. Sorry. Do you guys remember that? So long story short, the photoelectric effect caused scientists to rethink their thoughts on light. Because up until then, they had basically proven that light was a wave. Um, actually, going further back in history, um, do you remember me telling you about Isaac Newton? Newton was a big believer that light was a particle. And as long as Newton was alive, he kind of convinced everybody to say light is a particle. And so no one tried to argue with him because he was Sir Isaac Newton. He was like one of the most powerful, influential scientists ever. Uh, he was the chair at Cambridge. Do you guys know what that means? So Cambridge is like one of the universities in, in England and basically like he's the head of the department there, if that kind of makes sense. So like he pretty much had one of the most high positions of, I don't know, of power I guess is a good way of putting it, at like influential universities. So if Isaac Newton said light was a particle, no one disagreed with him basically. But then after Newton died, people started doing experiments on light and discovered that, well actually it behaves like a wave. And the two main things that prove that were refraction and diffraction. So refraction is where light goes through, like, say, air into water, and it bends. Does that make sense? Whereas diffraction is if you were to have, like, a double or a slit, and wave comes in, and then it does this sort of picture to it. Does that make sense? So, long story short... For a while there, they thought light is a particle. Well, then they thought light was a wave. And then now at the turn of the 19th, no, 20th century, so that's like 1900s, 1920s, uh, they start to re-examine and say, 
maybe light is actually a particle as well. And so the first main thing that changed their mind was this photoelectric effect. The idea that, well, what if light is actually not coming in waves, but in indiscrete or discrete packets called photons. So uh, Einstein was actually a huge part of this. And because of him, physicists eventually predicted that photons should have momentum. Here's the problem, though. What's the formula for momentum that we've already learned? Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. As far as we understand, though, light doesn't have a mass. It has a velocity. What's the velocity of light? 3 times 10 to the 8th. I mean, unless it's in a different medium and getting slowed down. So they predicted, well, if it acts as a particle, particles have momentum. Right? So there's a bit of a problem. Uh, eventually, though, they managed to derive a formula for momentum. And these two, I believe, are on your data sheet. Or there's only one of them on your data sheet. Is, is this one on the data sheet? OK. How does this one get created, then? Do you guys remember the formula of velocity equals frequency times wavelength? Well, this wavelength right here then would be equal to, uh, what would it be, velocity over frequency? Only rather than calling it velocity, they're going to call it C for the speed of light. So really they've just taken this guy right here and they've plugged in C over F. But since on the bottom it's flipped upside down, does that make sense? So. so they came up with a formula, but how did you prove this experimentally? Uh, before I do that, I actually want to show you how they derived this formula. So remember how momentum is equal to mass times velocity. Okay. Um, we haven't covered this formula yet, but maybe you've heard of one of Einstein's most famous formulas, E equals mc squared. So if light is supposed to have a mass, but we really can't measure its mass, Using Einstein's formula here, they rearranged for E equal, or M equals E over C squared. So energy divided by speed of light. So see how they've thrown this M right here as E over C squared? Um, but C is the velocity of the speed of light, and V is also the velocity of the speed of light. So really, they basically said, well, let's cancel this one with that one. Does that make sense? Because C is a velocity just of the speed of light. So it leaves you with momentum is energy over speed of light. And then from Planck's formula, energy is equal to frequency times wavelength. So that's where the second formula came in. P equals HF over lambda. Or if you don't want to work with frequency, you could, um, whoops, not over lambda, over, what am I doing here? Over C, because that's this guy right here. You could change the F over C into a wavelength. Does that make sense? I don't think you'll ever need to know how these formulas came to be, but physicists basically figured out, here's a formula that should, I'm using fingers here, work. But let me go back to this last line here. Here's the hard part. They had to try to prove it experimentally. Um, any of you guys watch Big Bang Theory? So the two main guys on Big Bang Theory are Sheldon and Leonard. Uh, Sheldon is a theoretical physicist. You guys know what that means? Sure, yeah. He does a lot of work on paper, basically, right? Or he does them on whiteboards, right? And he tries to prove things, you know, that in his head should be true, right? And so here we've just theoretically, I shouldn't put that back in there. Here we've theoretically come up with a formula for momentum of a photon of light. But experimentally, that's what Leonard does on Big Bang Theory. He actually goes out into a lab and then tries to test these theories and prove that they're true. Does that make sense at all? So that was the hard part is, well, okay, on paper this makes sense, but how do I prove it? So uh, here's the guy that you should know. His name is Compton, hence the term the Compton effect. Uh, it took him a while. It wasn't until the, in 1923, so that's like 20 years after uh, Planck came up with his first thing in 1900. Uh, he was working with high-frequency x-rays, and he shot them into different materials. If light is supposed to be a wave, imagine light as a wave right here. Well, if you shoot it into a high-density material, it should compress the wave, if it acts as a wave. But what if light isn't a wave? What if light is a particle? So here's what actually happened when we consider, well, how do I put this here? Here's what actually happened when he actually tested it. 
he shot his wavelengths of x-rays in. And rather than the x-rays coming straight through like this, they actually went off at an angle. You could actually measure this angle right here. And it also kicked up an electron, which is kind of similar to the photoelectric effect. Does that make sense at all? What was that? It should act just like the photoelectric effect. What they really discovered that was happening here is if this thing is not a wave, but if this thing actually is a particle, then, I mean, when you think of this matter right here, you know, aren't there going to be other particles inside there? You know, protons, neutrons, electrons. And what happened is it's, it's almost like a collision where this guy comes in as a photon, hits some sort of matter, the photon goes off at this direction, and an electron gets bumped the other direction. What is this really similar to? Collisions that we did in our first unit. When I look at this, I think of the curling experiment we did, where you send a curling rock in, right? And one curling rock goes this way, and another curling rock goes this way. Does that make sense? So let me just recap to make sure I'm saying this properly here. This is if light behaves as a wave, which it often does, this is what you would have expected. <coughs> You'd expect these longer wavelength x-rays to get compressed into smaller x-rays. But that's not what happened. When Compton did his experiment, this is what happened. Longer x-rays, or smaller waves right here, actually turned into longer waves, the opposite of what he expected, and they actually wanted an angle instead. This was evidence, therefore, that light was actually a particle and that it had a momentum. And so I'm just going to read this part out here. Using conservation of energy and conservation of momentum and photon theories, uh, Compton was able to explain his results. So we called them the Compton effect. So uh, let me give you some examples of questions. I've only actually got one. It's fairly straightforward. Um, let me just make sure you guys can look at that. Here's what you guys need to know then. If EMR is a particle, it has momentum. So we should be able to find a momentum of the photon coming in. Then the photon itself should get scattered at an angle. So it should also have a momentum. But one of the changes here is that the wavelength is going to, the, the wavelength right here should increase. It should be a high energy wave to start and then it's going to lose some of its energy down here. Does that make sense? If it's losing energy, it can't actually lose energy though, right? So where does the remaining energy go? Yes, to the electron. Does that make sense? So a momentum here and a momentum here, and then an electron can also have a momentum. So the point I want to make here is that electron momentums can be calculated using mv, because electrons actually have mass and we're probably going to be looking for a velocity. Whereas EMR waves, they don't have a mass, so we have to calculate their momentums here based on Planck's constant over the wavelength. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, one last formula. There is another formula that Compton came up with, and this was to help find the change in wavelength because he recognized that as these waves were hitting metal and deflecting off in different directions, the wavelength was changing. It would be like blue light was turning into red light. So he, had a, he, he calculated a formula to figure out how much change in wavelength there was. Yeah. So long story short, this one's pretty easy. Uh, to find your change in wavelength, you need to know uh, Planck's constant, always the same. M and C, so M is the mass though, but of the electron itself. So that's always uh, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. C is the speed of light. Uh, the last thing you need to know is the angle though. And you gotta be really careful. The angle is the scattered X-rays angle. Not the angle that the electron goes at, but the angle at which the actual X-ray is gonna scatter. Let's try an example. I've only got one, actually. 
So let's say you take an x-ray and I give you the initial wavelength and we shoot it at a piece of graphite. Is it always just um, Those are typically what we're used, but it's got to be something high energy, so I guess. Anybody? <laughs> I would say you could probably do this also with um, gamma rays as well. I'm thinking visible light, though, might not have enough energy to actually make a collision work. Does that make sense? Because visible light was barely able to make the photoelectric effect work. Does that make sense? Like, usually it was taking, like, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy, right? So, I mean, like, radio waves and microwaves, they won't be able to pull this off at all. Maybe visible light? Doubtful? I mean, visible light is hitting stuff all over the place. Is electrons getting bumped? Um, what was that? Even then, photoelectric effect was barely happening with, like, say, blue or purple light. Like, it was really taking ultraviolet for it to have enough energy to happen. Does that make sense? Like, what does something like that look like? Well, the best example of that is, like, those, um, I talked about, like, garage door openers. Right? I mean, there you're basically sending a laser beam across the bottom, right? And hopefully that'll bump electrons out. So, I mean, depends on what color that is. Often they're green, I think. So, green's a pretty high frequency of light. No, I mean, as opposed to, like, say, red, orange, or yellow. So, does that make sense? So how is the Compton effect different from the photoelectric? Okay, so photoelectric effect is just a piece of metal that's getting hit, and then the electrons are coming out here. Here what's actually happening is the, the wave itself is going to now deflect, and the and, and electron is going to get bumped out more as, like, a momentum collision. So but they are, they're very similar, though, like, in terms of concept. Basically, light is hitting electrons and causing the electrons themselves to move. Does that work? Okay, so let's, first thing we got to do is figure out the wavelength of the scattered x-ray. I'm just going to draw a quick diagram here. Imagine that you've got like a piece of metal. I don't really care what it is. It said it was graphite. And send a wave in. Well, what should happen is this wave should go off at an angle and it should kick out an electron. So far, so good? Okay. Uh, we get to know the wavelength. This wavelength is the 1.28 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. And the only other information I'm giving you is that this angle right here is 15 degrees. Okay. So, this is my opinion. I feel like this section is going to be fairly straightforward because there's only two formulas to use. You almost always use them in conjunction with each other. So, um, the formula that I just showed you was this guy here, delta lambda equals h over mc. times 1 minus cosine theta. So let's start plugging numbers in. What's h? Okay, so 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. Uh, what do we use for m? Yeah, it's the mass of a single electron. Um, C. Speed of light, so 3 times 10 to the 8. And then 1 minus cosine of 15 degrees. Well, okay, so let's talk about that in a second here. This is a change in wavelength. So when we're done here, we're then going to add this new change in wavelength to the original wavelength. So... Uh, I gave all my calculators away, so I need you guys' help. Um, anybody calculate a change in wavelength yet? Uh, I have 8.3. No, I have 8.3. Yeah, that's what I have. Yeah, that's what I have. Ten to the negative what? You got that as well? Okay, so let's just talk through what's happening here then. This is a fairly high energy wave. 
And what's going to happen is it's going to turn into a lower energy wave over here. The reason why it has to be lower energy is that some of that energy that's lost, quote unquote, is going to get converted into the electron. So the electron itself can now have some energy. Does that make sense? Yeah, if we were to find these two energies, hopefully this one right here will be the other one. We're going to do that last, just to confirm. So um, now that we have our change in wavelength, if the wavelength therefore gets bigger, the frequency would decrease. Does that make sense? If you increase the wavelength, the frequency is decreasing. Therefore, this new wave has less energy. So I now need to add this number to 1.28 times 10 to the minus 12. Anybody added those yet? 1.4 times 10 to the negative 12 meters. Does that make sense? So the wavelength has now been lengthened, meaning that the frequency has been decreased, meaning that there is less energy in our outgoing wave. So then for the second part of the question, we'd now like to figure out the velocity of the ejected electron. Okay. To figure this out, use momentum. And there's a, there's a highly likely chance that this is going to be the momentum question you get. So we, we've already done this, where you have something going this way, something going this way. We know this is 15 degrees. And our job is to try to figure out basically this guy right here. This is the electron. Well, we're looking for the velocity of the ejected electron. So we want to figure out, well, how fast is this guy going to get booted out? Yeah. Well, two directions, yeah. It's not that bad, though. What's the formula for momentum of a photon? That's the other formula we just learned. Um, H over lambda. And we have lambda, right? So H over lambda. So 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. What was the original wavelength? 1.28? 1. 1. Was that it? The original one was 1.28 1. times 10 to the minus 12. So that's how much momentum your ingoing photon has. I really have to rely on you guys. <laughs> I don't have any calculators. Uh, so that's an 8. Why is it 0.28? Because that was the wavelength of the original x-ray. OK. Everybody get that who tried it? OK, then for the other one over here, we know this guy's momentum. His momentum is going to also be p equals h over lambda. But he has a different lambda. It's that one we just calculated. So it'll be 663 times 10 to the minus 34. And then you guys just calculated a new wavelength, a longer wavelength of uh, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 12. as well. Okay, here's the problem with that one though. This momentum is the hypotenuse. Make a note of this. Is the hypotenuse of this triangle right here. Does that make sense? So with it being the hypotenuse and having the angle, what do we typically do in a momentum question? Sine and cosine. Yeah, we can find the uh, we can find the momentum in the y direction, and we can also find the momentum in the x direction. Well, okay, so let's talk through how they're going to be helpful to us. Let's say we find the y direction's momentum. It's going to be the exact same as the electron's y momentum. Does that make sense? 
But why do we need the X momentum one? Well, yes, for, for both of those, because this guy right here is only X momentum. And then if we can figure out this guy's X momentum, then the rest of it must be the electron's momentum. Let me write some formulas out here. The momentum of the photon one in the X direction is going to be equal to the momentum of photon two in the X direction plus the momentum of the electron in the X direction. Does that make sense? Like this momentum right here will be equal to both of these two things as X momentum. And then the momentum of the photon two in the Y direction will be equal to the momentum of the electron in the y direction. However up this guy goes is how far down that guy goes. Does that make sense? If we can find this x and this y, we can use uh, Pythagoras' theorem and find the resultant. Does that make sense? Okay, let me see that I can try to draw this out in different colors. So I'm going to draw one triangle in blue and one in green. So green right here, let me just color coordinate everything actually. We'll make this one be red. That's our incoming momentum, which we already have. That's this value right here. Does that make sense? And then in green, this is going to be photon, photon 2 in the x direction. This is going to be photon 2 in the y direction. So this will be going this way and this way. And then in blue is going to be the electron, which is going to be electron in x and electron <laughs> in y. So however much up this goes is how much down this guy goes. That was probably the easiest one. Whereas if I want to figure out how much over this one goes, it's really going to be this one minus this one. So like in your x direction, you have red coming in. That's the only input momentum you have. And when you're done, you're going to have some green and some blue. So that's what this formula here is trying to say. Your photon 1 in the x direction coming in should be equal to your x's photon 2 plus in blue now, I guess. I should change my colors. So basically both of the x momentum. Both of these two x momentums need to add up to this guy right here, which we already know. So let's try doing it. I don't, I don't have a calculator, so I have to rely on you guys' help here. So let me, let's do it one at a time here. First, let's figure out um, the x and y components of this triangle right here. So if that's 15 degrees in the corner here, then let me redraw this even better. So here's our triangle. This momentum you guys just told me was 487 times 10 to the minus 22. That's the hypotenuse. And this is 15 degrees. So sine or cosine goes on this side. Which one goes where? Okay, so this is going to be the sine of 15 times 487 times 10 to the minus 22. And this will be cosine 15 times 487 times 10 to the minus 22. Does that make sense? Anybody have some values for me? Get this? Yeah. Okay, so now let's plug some numbers into our formulas here. 
if this is how much upwards momentum the photon has, it should be the exact same as the downward momentum of the electron. So I'm just going to redraw another triangle here. I'm going to do this one in blue. Sean, shouldn't we make this like a sense That'll work. Not when we're doing our actual like um, Pythagoras' theorem, it won't matter. But yeah, if this one's going up at 126, this one's going down at negative 126 times 10 to the negative 22. So that one's probably the easiest to do. This is going to be your electron y direction value right here. Okay, how do we figure out this x direction one though? Yeah, so you're going to take this momentum right here, and we're going to subtract this momentum right here. So that's going to be 518 times 10 to the minus 22 minus this value right here. This will give us the x electron. So 518 minus 470. So 518, yeah, you gotta go back and find it. I got 3.1432. 518 minus 470? 4.1432. Yeah. Okay, because wasn't the first number 518? Yep. And then you're minus 4, minusing 470. Because it's got to be a one point something, doesn't it? Four point. Well, I'm just looking here. Five eighteen minus four seventy. Shouldn't that be like a one point? Oh no, because it's it's less than one, right? Never mind. I'm I'm backwards here. What'd you guys get? Okay. Negative twenty three. Is everyone in agreement to that number there? So long as you're in agreement here. We're almost done then. We now have the x direction electron and the y direction electron. So then we should be able to find a hypotenuse by doing c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So I mean, this number is one of them. This number is the other one. So square, square, add them together, square root. Find us a final momentum here. Okay, so the, 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 the hypotenuse, is that what you're saying you got? No, uh, oh. we're talking about uh, the subtracted value. Oh, okay. So you don't get 4.8 times to the minus 23. I got that now. Oh, you did, okay. Anybody get a resultant then by finding the hypotenuse? Okay, so that is the resultant. Now that should be like momentum units, which would be kilograms, meters per second. I kind of skipped writing units the whole time because, boy, that was going to be ridiculous because these numbers are dumb anyways, right? Okay, last question then. We were supposed to find the velocity of this thing. So P is equal to this, right? It's equal to MV. So to find, by, find your velocity, divide away the mass, basically. Yeah, so if like P equals MV equals 1.35 times 10 to the minus 22, divide mass, divide mass, so take 1.35 times 10 to the minus 22 and divide by an electron's mass, and that should give us our velocity. Yeah, we should only get two because of that angle. What would you say? Sorry that I, I'm kind of a mess here. I don't have my calculator, so I'm kind of putting a lot of trust in you guys. <laughs> you get that? Okay, let's just re-talk through the steps, just to make sure you guys did.
did understand where all these numbers came from because I feel like I was not as clear as I wanted to be. You're going to have an incoming photon ray, which they're probably going to give you the wavelength of. We can then use the first formula to find the change in wavelength for the outgoing ray. Once you find that change in wavelength, you can find this momentum right here just in the x-direction. And you can find this momentum here, but it's, it's going to be on an angle as a hypotenuse, which kind of sucks. So you have to use trig to find the x and y values of this number, which hopefully we did well enough. This guy's y value up is going to be the same as this guy's y value down, which is fantastic. That one's easy. This green x value right here plus this blue x value right here should add up to be this red x value coming in, which we already have. So if you take the red one and subtract the green one, it should give you the blue one, which is the electron, which now means that you have the electron in the x direction and the y direction. Pythagoras theorem them to find the hypotenuse and then divide by the mass and that should give you its velocity. One last thought in terms of velocity. Um, how fast is this thing right here traveling? Well, hopefully the speed of light. How fast is this guy right here traveling? Again, hopefully the speed of light. Well, in terms of like a, an answer here, is this guy going the speed of light itself? It should not be going faster than the speed of light though, should it? No. But is it in the same ballpark? Yeah. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? That it kind of ends with a times 10 to the 8. It should be going fairly fast, I guess, as it gets ejected. Okay, one last thing, then we'll take a break here. We just did conservation of momentum. That's probably the best way of approaching this, but in theory, we could also try conservation of energy. They solve, the solve for the same thing. Now, one of the big differences is that energy is a, is, a, is a scalar, not a vector, which makes this kind of nice because we don't actually have to like worry about angles. So like in terms of conservation of energy, you have the energy of your original photon. You're going to have your energy of your second photon plus some of that energy is now going to get given as like say kinetic energy. And if conservation of energy holds, we might be able to solve this a second way. So I just want to see how this works. How would we find the energy of the first photon? It's not one half mv squared because we don't have mass for photons. That'll work. Hf. Now do we have f though? Well, why don't we just change the formula? Is it uh, C over lambda we can do? Yeah. Is that the right way of doing it? Yeah. HC over lambda. And then it's really, it's the exact same thing for the second photon. Only the wavelengths are different. Uh, last thing, kinetic energy. One half mv squared. Oh, that's the ugliest two ever. So why don't you guys try solving for V here and see what you get. I actually haven't done this one myself yet. I'm curious, but I'm hoping it comes to be basically the same as what we get for velocity here. Yeah, so let's write in all these numbers. This will be 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. This is 3 times 10 to the 8. And then this, the original wavelength was uh, 128 times 10 to the minus 12. It's the exact same stuff here. Would you, oh, never. Wait, never. Uh, what was our new wavelength? 1.4 something times 10 to the minus 12? Yeah. And then this will be 1 half of 9, 11 times 10 to the minus 31 V squared. So. We'll have to leave the math to you guys again. But try solving for a velocity using energy. See how that turns out. Uh, the new wavelength was, I think, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 12. Because that was what we calculated in the oh, previous question. The yeah, you had to add the new change in wavelength to the original one. So take that whole thing, subtract that whole thing, times by 2, divide by mass and square root. You did square root? 
I'm not sure it will be the same. Okay. I, I do have a point to make. I just I want to find what you guys solve for first, though. I'm hoping it'll be in the relative ballpark. It's like, is that 1.5? Okay. So 1.7 times 10 to the 8 meters per second? Get an answer? Yeah. 1.7? Okay. Um, the reason I wanted to point this out here is we talked something before about elastic versus inelastic collisions. Do you guys remember those terms from a ways, ways back? We were never allowed to use conservation of energy in our first unit to solve this because energy typically isn't conserved. There's usually something lost, small, minute amounts of energy. And even at a microscopic level like this, it's really close. But does that concept make sense here that we, we, energy is conserved, but there's probably something lost even yet still here to like say heat. If we're doing this on a Don't use energy. Okay. okay. Like the point behind this is we should be using momentum. Okay. okay. But this is probably as close as we're ever going to get. Uh, the terms we used were elastic collisions mean that energy is actually conserved. And this is really close. Does that make sense? Um, whereas inelastic collisions, they're not conserved. Energy is lost to some form or another, right? Something could be compressed slightly and squished in. You lose to, like, say, light, heat, or sound energy. Does that make sense? So this probably is as close to elastic as we can get, but it does not appear that it gave us the same answer. So it probably was an inelastic collision. So long story short, don't use energy. But it's close though. Okay, that's all I got. Um, quick recap then. I feel like so long as you can handle like numbers kicking around everywhere here, it's actually not that hard because it's we've already done this. It's momentum. Does that make sense? Yeah, it just takes forever. So I feel like there's a good shot that if they don't give you a, a momentum question in like the beginning of the test where you have to break it up into like up and down and x and y, expect a Compton formula later. Compton formula later, right? But somewhere in the test, they're probably gonna test you on a two-dimensional momentum question where something goes up, something goes down, you know what I mean? So, I would only expect one though. Like, I don't think they're gonna give you like eight questions like this. Cause it'd take a while, right? So, any questions? Okay, that's all I got, so. Um, why don't you guys take a break? When you come back, uh, there is a new assignment posted, actually. So you guys can probably print that off if you haven't done the first one yet.